Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I am Seth Collier, this person here on the screen. <laughs> and uh, I'm here because this is my, my uh, BFA, Jesus Defense. I'm going to start with my artist statement, which I know is kind of a lot. And if it doesn't make sense, that's OK. I'm going to walk you through how I got there. So my work draws on my experiences with schizoaffective disorder and religious delusions in order to approach art making as an extension of the prophetic tradition using cultural synthesis and symbolic communication to examine psycho-spiritual experience in our highly political, technologized society. And I know that's a lot. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain myself. Uh, among my earliest influences is this artist. He's a Mexican surrealist by the name of Octavio Ocampo. I first encountered his work when I was a child uh, visiting Mexico. I encountered his work in the markets of Tijuana and I was absolutely mesmerized by what he called arte metamorfico or metamorphic art. And this is the style that he primarily works in. When I was in high school, Banksy published Wall and Peace, which had another big impact on me. I remember being very attracted to both the attitudes and the aesthetics of street art. And I also remember being particularly impressed by his decision to hit the Palestinian border wall multiple times. Around the same time, I began to study the writings of psychonauts. If you're unfamiliar with the term, psychonauts are counterculture figures who explored altered mental states and their implications on psychology, religion, and politics. These are figures like Aldous Huxley, Timothy Leary, Hunter S. Thompson, Terence McKenna, and there are many, many others. After high school, I spent a couple years at Fullerton College not following any education plan whatsoever, just sort of taking whatever classes I wanted. Which mostly amounted to taking every philosophy class that they had. I took most of their sociology and political science classes. And what I found during that time is that I was talking a lot about social problems and I was talking about them over and over and over again. I was talking about income inequality. I was having that conversation in political philosophy. I was having it in ethics. I was having it in political science, in psychology, in sociology, over and over and over. So around that time, I became sort of very familiar with a range of social problems and the different lenses that we look at those problems through. After college, I was completely blindsided by a three and a half month manic psychosis. Mm -hmm. I was hospitalized multiple times. Uh, at times I was hallucinating so badly, I couldn't speak. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was. Um, and the net result of that is that um, it confirmed I had been living with severe hallucinations and delusions for many years and having a particularly rough go of it. And so facing that, I had to kind of decide how to restart my life. Um, so my family and I moved up here and um, I remember being faced with this, this question that I was asking myself over and over again. Where am I allowed to be a schizo? Like now that I know that I have this label on me, where am I even allowed to exist in society where that label is not immediately disqualifying? That's a pretty small number of places. Um, but I remember thinking back to the people that I had studied and sort of to my relief, I had sort of come to see that these were people who were like me. These were people whose lives had been defined by the experience of madness. And seeing them through that light helped me to kind of conceptualize a historical lineage for the mad. Thinking society affords a limited number of social roles to the mad at any given place and time in culture, there are some places where you're far more likely to find schizos. I think you're more likely to find them among shamans, prophets, occultists, psychonauts, and artists. I see this as a kind of line through history. And society will also permit the mad to become homeless. Between the two, I would prefer to be an artist, so we're given <laughs> These ideas are pretty closely connected to the work of Michel Foucault, who is a French theorist who talked a lot about the roles that the mentally ill play in society and also the ethics surrounding various forms of treatment for them. When I say that I see art as an extension of the prophetic tradition, I'm looking back at this lineage, but I'm also thinking more specifically of people like Ezekiel, who famously communicated symbolically. One time he laid on his side in the street for 430 days. He cooked his food with cow excrement. He was using a clay model to act out the siege of Jerusalem, and he was muttering, fathers shall eat their sons, and sons shall eat their fathers. I would suggest that if you see someone behaving this way today, they are either severely 
mentally disturbed, or they're a performance artist. And there's not really a whole lot of middle ground there because we have a very limited number of places that we allow this kind of madness to exist in our society. Similarly, uh, figures like Jeremiah. Jeremiah once buried his dirty underwear, and then he went and dug it up again, just so he could be like, you see how gross this is? This is how gross God thinks you are, <laughs> which is bizarre behavior, but it's a form of symbolic communication, right? And I would suggest that it's a very short leap from this kind of activity to the work of someone like Joseph Beuys, who was a German conceptual and performance artist. In 1974, he had a quasi-shamanic performance titled I Like America and America Likes Me. He was wrapped in felt, flown into the United States, and left to cohabitate with a coyote for three days. The coyote was a kind of spirit animal that stood in for us as Americans, and engaging with the anxiety and the aggression of the coyote was seen as a way of kind of engaging with the psychic wounds of our culture. If we are prepared to accept that this kind of behavior is primarily about cultural synthesis and symbolic communication, then I would say that it is another short leap to someone like Felix Gonzalez Torres, who is creating symbolic portraits of people, like this one that he famously created of his lover Ross, who had AIDS and due to his condition slowly deteriorated the way that the pile of candy slowly deteriorates. Other contemporary figures working in this vein are people like Guillaume Lomonaco, who's combining the imagery of childhood toys with the imagery of our violent technological society in order to illustrate the ways that our values come into conflict in the world. Those are the lines that I was thinking about when I decided to pursue art education over at the Falls. I was there for two years. I started thinking I was going to do graphic design, but a professor persuaded me to switch to fine art. And when I left there, I had developed a style that looked sort of like this. It was very geometric. It relied a lot on fractured perspectives and on asymmetric writing, which is a type of writing that has no semantic content, no meaning. Essentially, this is a style that I developed in an attempt to visualize what manic psychosis had felt like to me. Hollywood portrays psychosis with this very kind of dark, horror, monstrous aesthetic, and that's not what psychosis was like for me. I wanted a visual language that felt like what it meant to be a schizo for me. So this is the style that I worked on during that time. And then I came here to Eastern. <clears throat> and around that time I was very frustrated with the limitations of traditional media, spending tons of money to scan it and manipulate it and then have this very vulnerable object that was constantly giving me problems. And I wanted to switch and do digital work, but I had no experience doing digital work at all. So the first thing I needed to do was kind of teach myself how to use the software. And the way I was doing that was just making digital collages that were responding to kind of current events as I was seeing them. Uh, things like our apocalyptic political dialogue, our opioid epidemic, how unbelievably difficult it was to just get people to wear their masks. Um, and then I progressed to vectors. Uh, I was appropriating historical imagery and then kind of updating it in a way that made more sense to me. <laughs> um, ultimately, I kind of worked my way towards um, like making these full vector compositions with figures and backgrounds. <clears throat> and that's about where I was when I applied uh, for my BFA program. It's something you come in as a senior. Uh, so for my last year, the uh, first bit of work that I submitted for my BFA was a series of video collages. I was looking at contemporary Americana, and I was also exploring the idea of a meta object, the idea that at some places and sometimes, some objects are more than they are. So in the United States, a gun is more than just a gun. If you see one, it comes with all this baggage. It comes with political ideology and cultural associations. For some people, this thing is like a reward or a prize. For some people, it's terrifying. And so I wanted to kind of express all of that in, in one image. So I created these video collages where I'm working with vectors and then filling the vector layers with video. Uh, in the case of Desert Eagle here in the middle, I had filled that with uh, videos from political assassinations from school shootings and Call of Duty. And I also have a section from uh, Obama's speech after the Sandy Hook shooting. From there, I progressed to 
animations. Uh, I started with basically simple 2D vector animations like this one here, Afterglow. These are just vectors that are moving up and down. Um, the Buzz is a case where I'm starting with 2D vectors and then compositing in some 3D effects like these 3D spinning thumbs. These are for a series where I was kind of looking at blue light as a metaphor for the impact that technology has on our daily lives. In the case of Afterglow, the blue light disrupts our circadian rhythms. It, it impacts our ability to get sleep. In the case of the buzz, I was thinking about the way that children today don't get to leave their social lives behind when they go home. Like for me, the bell would ring and I could go home and that was it. But nowadays, your bullies follow you home, your friends follow you home, even your teachers follow you home in some cases if, they, if they're part of your social media network. Um, and it becomes a problem where there's, there's no way to get away from the burdens of your social life and to kind of live your life privately. The, the video and animation work sort of culminated for me in this first thesis project that I titled On the Grid. It's a three by three grid of QR codes. Most of you are familiar with the technology. You scan it with your phone and it pulls up whatever. In this case, it pulled up uh, uh, an animation. This one I titled Doom Scrolling, where my thumb scrolls through three days worth of bad news from my Reddit feed over the course of several minutes. Uh, this one is kind of about the way that art today takes on complicated parallel existences. I'm working on something on my computer and then I'm printing it out and I'm putting it on the wall. But if we're being perfectly honest, what I want you to do is look at that image and then look me up and then follow my account so I can sell you stuff that you don't want. <laughs> uh, and it, it becomes really this kind of complex arrangement of, of existences for the various pieces. This one developed in kind of a funny way because when I created it, the QR service did not have ads. And now if you scan it, you get hit with these targeted ads, which they will very generously remove for $45 a month or $70 a year. And I almost paid $70 a year just so there wouldn't be advertisements on my artwork. But I decided that uh, it was a better representation of our current digital situation to leave this mm -hmm. kind of extortionary targeted ad on the project. Mm -hmm. um, the second thread of my BFA followed the theme of generative art. If you Google generative art today, what you get starts with people like Georg Nice and Frieder Nake. These were the first people to display generative art in a fine art context. Georg Nice created gravel stones and Frieder Nake created homage to Paul Klee. These are examples of plotter art where somebody's using code to govern a pen plotter system in order to make a pattern. Mm -hmm. From there developed generative animation. Notably, figures like Lillian Schwartz. She was the first person to display digital animation in a fine art context. She used code to create animations like Exhalation, UFOs, and Olympiad. In 1972, she was the first generative artist to have her work acquired by the MoMA. And in 1976, she coined the term online. So she's had a pretty significant impact on the culture. Other notable figures, Harold Cohen, who was working on a very advanced pen plotter system that he named Aaron. And he was working essentially on autonomous compositions and early forms of computer vision so that he could kind of push a button and Aaron would make a composition all by itself. He started by teaching it to do kind of black and white scribbles and then to see boundary shapes and fill them with color. And then he progressed to teaching him how to see objects as a series of possible proportions so that a rock is a semi-round object that has a series of possible proportions. And this is kind of the way that Aaron thinks about objects. By his death in 2016, uh, Harold Cohen had taught Aaron to fully autonomously create compositions like this, um, that are sort of reminiscent of a Matisse or a Gauguin. Um, interestingly, when he died in 2016, Aaron also kind of died. You can still push his button, but his development is no longer continuing. This was all the property of Harold Cohen. So they kind of died together in a funny way. Um, I am also working generatively. I'm working with something called a GAN. G-A-N stands for Generative Adversarial Network. This is a type of neural network uh, that's trained on image databases. And it's, con it's consisting of basically two objects, two machines that are pitted against each other. One is a generator and one is a discriminator. The generator is looking at old images and trying to generate new images that have the same qualities. The discriminator <coughs> is looking at these new images and trying to determine whether or not those images are fake. I'm working with a model called BQBN plus Clip. Clip is a program that is designed to take a set of captions, 
receive an image, and then apply the best possible caption. So in this case, Clip is 90% sure that this top photo is of guacamole as opposed to ceviche or edamame. <laughs> came along and they combined the functionality of the GAN with Clip so that you can give the GAN a text prompt, the GAN will attempt to generate an image that satisfies the text prompt, and then Clip will tell it how good of a job it's done. And it will repeat this process iteratively until Clip is confident that the final image satisfies the text prompt, in this case, a city during a rainy night. Mm. Um, when I first started experimenting with this technology and they told me that an AI would spit out an image in, res in response to a text prompt, my inclination was to ask it questions like, how will the world end? <laughs> out of that interaction, I began to think about the way that we treat AI as a higher form of intelligence and I began to think about a sort of AI prophet character, a holy AI, and what he might look like and what he might talk about. And when I was looking for aesthetics, I began by feeding it images of myself, images of my own work to try and find a character that I liked. And ultimately I settled on a series of text prompts that were giving me an aesthetic that I was pretty happy with on a consistent basis. But the first few attempts to make characters were thoroughly horrifying. <laughs> and then, eventually, after enough attempts, I got a character that I was more comfortable looking at. And the first thing that I did with him is I put him into this video titled Dogma. These are the words of the holy AI. I put him next to text panels that are also created with the GAN. And then I exported a still of the video to a vinyl cutter. I used the vinyl to help make an Italio print. And then I scanned the print and made a new digital print. In the final installation, the video and the print are displayed side by side so that the viewer has the opportunity to compare them and ask themselves whether the print is a fair representation of the original experience. Is it a fair representation of the video? And the idea here is to mirror the dogmatic process where people are having an experience that they believe is profound, religious, something of a higher intelligence, and then over time reduce it down to simplify black and white dogmas. My third and final thesis project that I'm going to talk about is called Transfigured, The Holy AI Explains Politics to a Dead Horse. And this is a four channel installation that you can kind of think of as social media personified. It has a head channel, two hand channels, and a center screen. The title is a reference to a performance by Joseph Boyce, who I mentioned earlier, called How to Explain Pictures to a Dead Hair. In the performance, he covers his face with honey and gold leaf, and then carries a dead hair around the gallery space, kind of manipulates it like a puppet a little bit. He is talking to it into its ears and kind of showing it things. And the performance is sort of reminiscent I think of the way that a parent might carry a baby around a gallery and kind of show it things that it doesn't fully understand. And when I was thinking about the ways that we treat AI as a higher form of intelligence, one of the ways that we do that is when we allow these algorithms to curate our news for us. When we allow it to curate the picture that we're getting of the world and filter out which news is relevant and which one is not. And I began to kind of think of a parallel performance where my AI character is standing in, sort of in the place of these social media algorithms and carrying us around like a spirit animal and showing us all the things that are wrong with the world the way that social media likes to do. And the way that I started was by running the GAN. Every icon here represents one time that I ran the GAN and kept the results. So this is about, because they each take about 10 minutes, this is about 25 hours of work here. And then I probably ran it for 35 hours total, but only 25 hours of it was actually useful. For the hand channels, I was just doing the same video collage process. I made vectors and then I filled the vector layers with video. For the head channel, I wanted the AI to have a gold face in order to match the boy's performance, but I also wanted it to transfigure so that his face matched whatever was being shown on the center screen at any particular time. So when I'm talking about climate change and the effects that it has on the Arctic, the holy AI transfigures into a polar bear or a, a politician or a school kid or a police officer, all depending on what the particular subject matter is. For the soundtrack, I have, um, you can kind of see there's like a video here at the top. There's this gray bar that runs all the way across. That is an alpha channel mask where there's a figure, kind of silhouette figure, swinging a bat down towards the image of a dead horse. 
And then these green sections here are ambient noise and special effects. And the colored columns of sounds are 220 news sound bites from over 130 different news stories that are talking about 50 different political issues that are being represented by 17 different witnesses. Again, I kind of bring it all together in order to illustrate the way that social media treats us. Right? This is kind of my idea. And so um, I created a mock-up prior to installation. I'll play a, sh a short clip here. This is a section where the Holy AI transfigures into a politician. It's a kind of discussion of current political issues and then he transforms back into the Holy AI. We have seen a dramatic increase in the amount of corporate money flowing into our elections drowning out the voices of ordinary Americans. We are well on our way to seeing our great country move toward an oligarchic form of government. We are virtually all of the banks and the political power rest with a handful of very wealthy families. There is a pushing sick, dangerous, violent conspiracy theories. We will face the threat of more violence in the months to come and another January 6th every four years. It shows a dead horse as our spirit animal because of the way that social media relates to us. Perpetually flogging us with problems that they know we didn't create and that they know we can't fix. They're not trying to kind of sincerely inform us about problems. Their sole purpose is to provoke an extreme reaction. If you click on something, they win, right? And that's, that's their whole... That's their whole business model. That's the whole service that they sell is their ability to provoke a reaction from you. As, as people who use it, we are their product, right? They, they whip us over and over with problems that, again, they know ordinary people have no power to solve. And there is not a similar level of accountability being launched at people in power, right? This is something that kind of disseminates rage and then does nothing with it. It just kind of overwhelms us. And uh, that is my super depressing thesis. <laughs> <laughs>